Welcome back to Eye on South Asia. So, Bhavna, I was telling you about this uh, 2G license that was issued to about 122 countries. Yes. And uh, this was uh, during the uh, minister who was the former telecom minister and he's serving in the jail now, right now, mm -hmm. A.R. Raja. Um, he's been scrapped completely. I mean, this is a slap on India's face after what happened in the foreign direct investment um, deal with uh, Walmart in December. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we were just talking about what's happening in India, all these corruption scandals, yes. this is the first time an unprecedented act, such a big contract has been cancelled as arbitrary and unconstitutional manner. It was awarded in an arbitrary manner and an unconstitutional manner. Think about it. You're talking of billions and billions, trillions of dollars of money that was awarded in contracts right. and has been finally found after a lot of resistance, inquiry, yelling, screaming. It was arbitrary. Now, government has set aside four months, at mm -hmm. the end of which, again, the bids will be called and the contracts will be issued in the appropriate manner. Of right. course, the customer will be protected mm -hmm. and they will get a seamless service uh, from the new companies who will get this contract. It's honestly a shame for us. Right. Uh, and it's like we just awarded the $15 billion deal to France and uh, three years from now, we find out that is not the deal we should have ordered and we cancel it. Now, this is far bigger in scale. Mm -hmm. And not only just the shame of it, but it could have cost the government up to $36 billion in lost revenues from the sales of these uh, telecom licenses. The numbers are going all over. You know, somebody has billions, somebody has trillions. God mm -hmm. only knows. But the fact is such a big technological advancement for the country, such a big contract being awarded and at the end of it, this is what we get. And this could have been the worst if the second part of it had been done. Supreme Court turned down, refused the order for CBI to investigate probe into the India's current Home Minister P. Chidambaram's mm -hmm. role in this scam because he was at that time the finance minister. Right. And Obviously, he should have known what he was doing. And the other person, Mr. Raja, was awarding the contracts. But, and there was, a, uh, there was a case filed against him by the Janata Party President Subramaniam Swami. And he had charged Chidambaram of wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. And uh, even there was a PIL, Public Interest Litigation, filed by Prashant Bhushan. And uh, the government kind of quashed it and they said no. Uh, the so he's charges... getting off scot-free for this? From this court, but uh -huh. you never know. This guy, Subramanian Swami, does not sit just like that. He'll be moving on to the next level. Of course, uh, the Supreme Court has asked um, the special investigation team to look into to the 2G case and they have asked CBI to file a status report and on its probe about uh, and give it to the Central Vigilance Commission. Mm -hmm. So there's Not, still further action that could potentially be taken, but as of now, it's... Been, it, it could create a mess yeah. if they had taken any step against the Home Minister Chidambaram. Mm -hmm. Next two months, budget session would be dead. Opposition would be yelling, screaming from the rooftops. Yeah. Uh, Bhavna, and I just touched as we talked earlier about uh, the U.S. reservations about India, fortunately has now issued the contract for the... Uh, 15 billion dollar, 11 billion dollar deal to France for 126 Rafale plus jets. Mm -hmm. And this is supposed to be a very big deal which really Europe wanted to get it. I mean, the competition against this was... Uh, the UK. Uh, the, from the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Britain really was trying very, very hard to see that uh, the um, Euro... Fighters Typhoon, which is the name of the competition mm -hmm. uh, plane that was contesting against Rafael, mm -hmm. um, could be given to the British. And right. he was very optimistic. In fact, he was saying, look, in fact, last week we covered that story that uh, he's talking about doing a trade treaty with India and Euro treaty with India and a bilateral relationship with it in expectation for something like this. Right. And he feels that those uh, Eurofighters Typhoons are far better than Rafael, but this time from what has been declared by the government of India is that there was no political pressure on the committee that selected the planes. It was purely bids, evaluation, and they, whatever they felt was right was being done. Mm -hmm. And um, the India's finance minister has clearly taken a position they're not going back from there. Okay, it's because this deal isn't actually set in stone yet, right? So 
we have um, David Cameron, the Prime Minister of UK. He's asking India to revisit this decision. Uh, but that was last week. But I think from what I heard today, or I can uh, kind of refer to it yesterday, mm -hmm. is that uh, this is a done deal. It's final. It's final. And it has very uh, nice, uh, you know, if you look at the mandate, it's very nice that out of the 126 planes, uh, I think about 18 will be uh, built in France and then balance will be built in India and there is a huge transfer of technology being done in India because India is really very keen to upgrade its aviation capabilities mm -hmm. and this deal helps bring that into India. Right. So one of the major decision making parameter was we should be able to bring technology to India mm -hmm. so they can build their own same fighter planes, the money will be Within given the country. and India can grow its technology and grow. Um, uh, advanced. Right. I know it has uh, made uh, the British Prime Minister David Cameron unhappy mm -hmm. because he really thought um, that India would reconsider this and uh, kind of give them a chance because uh, these two uh, these two planes were used um, in the um, uh, in the assault in Middle East and. Uh, he feels that they're as good as Rafael or probably better. Mm -hmm. But I think the decision has been made and uh, India is not going back on this discussion. Right. Uh, we have the United States Senator Diane Feinstein. She's a Democrat from California, California and she's a cha chairperson of Senate Select Committee Intelligence. And she has uh, mentioned that she a very unique term she has tossed this time. All along we used to say a terrorism state and a Taliban state and whatnot or military state. Mm -hmm. She is mentioning Pakistan as a puzzling state. I really like that terminology mm -hmm. because if you look at the civilian and the common man, they are as good as anybody else. Right. And when you look at the country's history, political history, military history, is puzzling. You never know which side they are going. Mm -hmm. Today, the Prime Minister, like we talked last week, will talk against the military regime and then next day he is again for it. Right. And the President will speak against it and then the next day he is in a different country, mm -hmm. uh, run away from there and to protect himself. Right. And so, as you mentioned, you know, it's declared as a democracy and yet its kind of natural allies are, you know, China and uh, Saudi Arabia and these sorts of authoritarian uh, regimes. Including North Korea. Right. So uh, it, it is obviously a puzzling factor for, <clears throat> as she mentions, uh, uh, the U.S. And um, uh, I personally like this terminology puzzling than a uh, Taliban state or a terrorism state. But of course, uh, you know, Pakistan has a very strategic role for America mm -hmm. and especially now Taliban seem to be growing again and it seems they have taken an upper hand. Uh, so we need to solve this puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to make sure that Pakistan and US remain good friends. Right. And uh, especially considering that they're a very, um, you know, real nuclear power, you know, to be considered. Which is the biggest worry for US. Right. And then he also mentions about the former Pakistani ambassador Hussein Haqqani who ran into trouble because of that whatever the, um, uh, the uh, paper that was released there and he has gone back since then. But I think through an extreme diplomacy they are trying to solve it and make it a, make the waters calm as I may call it. Yes, hopefully uh, so. <laughs> so uh, moving on uh, from there. Uh, uh, Bhana, in Washington, D.C., we have had lots of uh, Indians who have been appointed uh, in the Obama administration time and again into very, very good positions. Mm -hmm. And one of our uh, fellows was Suresh Kumar. And Suresh was uh, known as Obama's expert czar. And uh, he was the assistant secretary of commerce for trade and promotions. And he played a key role in achieving Obama's goals. Obama had given him a goal to move up from 11% of the GDP to 14% by 2014 mm -hmm. and the, he's into the exports and he has done very well. He has met his goal for 2012 mm -hmm. or 11. Now he is just supposed to be taking the administration to the next goal in 2014 but he has said that he has to move out which he had promised when he took the position. He said okay. I will serve for two years mm -hmm. but he needs to go back to the private sector where he belongs. Mm -hmm. But that's a big loss. 
considering that his son Aditya Kumar who also served as a deputy assistant to the vice president Joe Biden and a senior advisor to his chief of staff has also left for a private sector so it's a major exodus for the um, administration because uh, Suresh really brought in a lot of expertise behind him he worked with Melinda uh, and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates foundation he worked with African Development Bank he worked with Alliance for a Green Revolution in the past so he has also served as a teacher uh, in Rutgers University, Shulik School of Business in Toronto. I mean, he has a checkered record. He has a wonderful record, and I guess it will not be easy to fill up his space when he leaves. Or he's actually left now. Definitely, um, but there are um, some people who are entering the political stream, and and that would be Anish Chopra, yes. who um, resigned last week as the first White House Chief Technology Officer. Mm -hmm. And he is you know, expected to announce his candidacy for the Virginia Lieutenant Governor sure. post. And I think he, when he came into Washington DC for this appointment, he never left his roots. He was constantly between Virginia and Washington DC, which are of course very close right. by. Mm -hmm. And he had uh, always nourished the interest in being in the political arena. And yes. look, he has developed a huge network while being in the position that he was in. Mm -hmm. And that too mostly with the technocrats and the technology experts. So for him to be able to uh, get into political side, not as a purely politician, but mm -hmm. as a technocrat politician who can help the state right. uh, in its growth, in its trade, in its technology, which is the way future is going. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he has a tremendous future and for him to raise money should not be a problem. All these guys are raising money left, right and center. You heard Ro Khanna in California did very well. Mm -hmm. So I think this guy... Um, I think he has a very bright future ahead of him because he was... Um, said that he was bringing the Obama administration and all the records and everything into the 21st century, you know? Well, so, I'm sure he has built the systems that will continue to grow in that direction. Yes. But I think his major interest is to build Virginia into, as they call the Silicon Valley of the East, because that is what I think his long-term objective would be big. He's not really a political person mm -hmm. and he has the support of very big uh, guys from Indian community who are uh, going to help him, Sudhakar Shinoy and Ranveer Trihan and um, you know people like um, uh, the, pre the president of uh, Northern Virginia Technology Council. So I think um, this guy will offer a promise to Virginia and Virginia, Maryland have been doing very well. We broke the story that Virginia's governor had appointed a trade council to send it to India and build business with India. Mm -hmm. um, Bring a lot of jobs back. Back. Yeah. So I, I think it's a good move for us. Right. It should be interesting what happens with Virginia. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on to our next story, we have Harvard and Princeton universities are being targeted um, related to alleged discrimination against Asian American uh, sure. students and applicants for the undergraduate admissions. Mm -hmm. And despite these Asian Americans scoring very high on their SAT scores, you know, close to perfect, um, these students are still being denied admission. And that's very puzzling because when you look at the other ethnic groups such as, you know, the Caucasian or the Hispanic or African American groups, um, especially the Hispanic and African American are being more targeted and relatively readily accepted into the admissions. You know, what's going on with these Asian American students? Yeah, they have filed a protest in August of 2011 and one of the spokespersons said that in Princeton, it even uh, the review began in 2008 and actually US Education Department's Office for Civil Rights is already investigating this complaint mm -hmm. and uh, what we'll do is after the break when we come back we'll talk about uh, Surya Makkar's case who is a young student 12 years old again mm -hmm. a discrimination racial bias in schools yes. so it's colleges universities as prestigious as Princeton and Harvard and then we're talking about schools. Yes, very interesting story. We'll get right back to it after the break. Stay tuned. <laughs> 